starting out. So can anyone tell me what this picture is? Digital cat. Digital cat? It's a cat. That's Schrodinger's cat? That's Schrodinger's cat. That's right. Um, I figure since we were talking about Schrodinger today, um, we would talk about Schrodinger's cat. Um, do, do you know what Schrodinger's cat actually, what the story is behind Schrodinger's cat? Didn't they put them in the box with radioactive so they didn't mm -hmm. know if it was alive or dead? That's right. Um, basically, um, what the story is, is that when you're talking about um, quantum mechanics, that, that sort of thing, when you're talking about uh, the electron, you can't say exactly where it is until you detect it. And the same thing is true with, with Schrodinger's cat. As long as the box is closed, the cat is neither alive nor dead. It's both alive and dead simultaneously. And it's only until you open the box and see that you know for sure. And so basically the sort of the point was you can't determine um, the position of the electron exactly. Um, anytime you try and, and, and detect it precisely, some other part of it will be unknown. And so we'll sort of get into a little bit more of, uh, of, of what that means. But I, I just kind of like, I think it's a, it's a, it's a cool picture. Now, Kitty looks like it's made out of, uh, you know, diamonds or something. So anyway, where we left off last night was looking at the um, emission spectrum of hydrogen. And we could see that it had a very specific pattern. So if we looked at this pattern, and then this pattern, and then this pattern, there was there sort of, there was a, a, a regular array of these uh, emission spectrum. And so it was originally uh, Riedberg looked at it and was able to determine that these whole numbers, N1 and N2, and you could make them any whole numbers, and that would define uh, the distance between these, between these lines. And that led to um, our friend Bohr, Niels Bohr, to explain where all these lines came from by having the idea that each one of these is the light emitted by an electron moving from a high energy state, so these are the high energy states up here, down to the low energy or ground state, where the, where the hydrogen atom would usually be, but the electron floating around basically in this spherical um, shell around the, the nucleus. And as it moved further and further and further away, when energy was given to it, when it relaxed back to the ground state, it would release energy. And so he defined all of these different states up here as places far away from, from the nucleus, a certain specific distance that you could measure. So when it fell back, you could calculate precisely how much energy it was that was released. And it turns out that he, that, you know, these, these calculations were very precise and very accurate. So when you had electrons, and I'll look, at, look over on the left side of the screen. So when you have these electrons in an outermost uh, shell and then falling in, falling in, um, those particular energy levels were the infrared. And when you had these ones falling a little bit more, those were the visible. And the ultraviolet, when they fell all the way back to the ground state. So those were like big changes in energy. And, we, and if we remember, large changes in energy are related to large changes in the frequency. And so high energy means high frequency. And, you know, so Bohr won a Nobel Prize and everyone's saying his, his, uh, 
his praises. And then they started looking at other um, atoms. And it turns out other atoms were heinously more complicated, that there were hundreds, if not thousands of, of spectral lines, and they didn't follow that same regular pattern that was seen uh, for hydrogen. And so everyone started just scratching their heads saying, well, uh, maybe Bohr's model works well for hydrogen, but it sort of breaks down when we, when we look at anything else. How are we going to explain um, what's going on here? And if you remember, we talked a little bit last night about the difference between a wave and a particle. Um, that, and that what Bohr was thinking about was that the electron would be a particle. So that each one of these, this would be an electron up here, a particle that has a mass and a charge. And when it fell back, you could calculate exactly because it has a mass, there's a definite mass and a definite charge. And when it moves around, you could calculate precisely what these energies were. But when we started to look at more complex atoms, I said that broke down. And so our boy Erwin Schrodinger and around the teens and 19 teens and 1920s started working on the idea, well, maybe the electron isn't a particle. Maybe the electron would be better off if we treated it like a wave. Oops, let me go forward. If we treated it like a wave, so if we treated it like a wave, we could use equations that were developed for waves and see if those fit uh, these patterns of more of, of larger atoms better than particles do. And so, like I said, Bohr's theory gave a really good description of the hydrogen atom. It gave almost you know totally accurate and precise um, answers. But then when Schrodinger started um, plugging in equations that, that described how waves move and how waves um, operate. He came up with a wave equation that accurately gave energy levels of atoms that worked much better than, than Bohr's. In fact, it fit the, it fit the pattern for uh, the emission of hydrogen and helium and carbon and fluorine and oxygen, it basically, it fit all of them. And so you could pretty much imagine that, yeah, Schrodinger won a Nobel Prize too. Um, <laughs> and I think some, some, sometime in the 30s. And then, since he was German, he fled uh, Nazi Germany uh, to come to America because uh, the Nazis wanted Schrodinger to help them build an atomic bomb. And he was not interested in doing that. So Schrodinger was a pretty cool dude. So what happened next? This is Schrodinger's equation. <laughs> and this is some sort of, you know, science nerd, probably some engineer or something who's way too into it. And so, of course, the next um, recitation will be everyone in class has to derive this, this, this equation. What do you think? Does that sound like a pretty good idea? <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't understand it. It's way too complicated. Yeah, I, I mean, I sort of understand. I mean, that is a sum. I, I kind of get that, and but yeah, the rest of it is just. I, I, I took like second year calculus in college, and I think that's a div or a curler. I can't even remember. So yeah, it's it is well beyond <laughs> this this particular class. That's like for graduate school in physics, that, that sort of thing. But uh, the point of uh, showing you this is that basically he took um, particles, converted them into waves. And what these equations do is tell you the way waves would, would um, operate. If you moved waves back and forth uh, uh, away from the nucleus, and does that fit things better and it turns out it fit things much better. So this equation is correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, people have people. That's the cool thing. I mean, this he came up with this ninety years ago, and no one's improved on it really. It's I mean, it's 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 the thing. It's it. People are still using the, this uh, equation. So I mean, he's he's pretty much the Mac Daddy of, of quantum mechanics. So he I mean, he came up with this. Other people have uh, added uh, things to it. But I mean, this is this is the basis of everything we know, and if, and, and all all of the calculations and everything else is this is the basis of that. And I'm not even sure this is the whole thing. I think this is pretty much what fit on the dude's back. <laughs> you know, I, there could there could be more of it, and there are simpler ways of of looking at it. But I I just saw this online. It just it just made me laugh. So what it breaks down to, like this whole insane um, uh, equation, when, it, when you start plugging numbers into it and it starts spitting out answers, and one of the answers it spits out is the probability of finding that electron in a particular place. And so we call that, and again, this is stuff we don't really need to know, but I sort of just want to tell you how it works so there's a bit of a background. We call that a distribution function. A distribution tells us the probability. And again, the probability fits in with Schrodinger's cat again, because uh, as I mentioned before, we can't measure these things exactly. There's only a probability of, of any of these measurements. And so what we look for is the highest probability is probably closest to being correct. And then when we come and now we have, we have ways of physically measuring these things. Like we can physically measure the distance of electrons from the nucleus. And it turns out that Schrodinger's equation works really well for that. For instance, this is the result of looking, it's like what's the most probable place for the single electron of hydrogen in the ground state. And so you plug that information into Schrodinger's equation, you chew and chew and choose and choose on it, and it spits out this graph. This is the graph that it spits out. And so what it tells you is that the maximum probability of that electron being found is at 52.9 picometers. Now picometers are 10 to the 12th, 10 to the minus 12 meters so very very small distance and we can actually measure that uh, distance physically and that is correct that is that is where we find um, most of the electrons because the electron is moving constantly right so you can't really freeze it in place and you know see where it is but you can slow it down at, at uh, cool temperatures and measure the probability of where you find them and you get something that looks exactly like that. Because we can't look at a single electron, we can look at basically at a whole bunch of electrons. And so we're gonna get a, we're gonna get a distribution and the distribution that we measure is exactly the same as the distribution that Schrodinger predicts. And so, yeah, he was onto something here. So you may notice for the first time something called a 1s orbital. And we're going to get into what that means. 1s orbital is the simplest um, shape that electrons can take as they spin around the nucleus. And 1 means it's the closest. So hydrogen has one electron and the 1s orbital is what it's spinning around in. And we'll show you uh, how we define that and define some of the rest of them. So, like, as I mentioned, probability density basically tells you where are all the electrons most likely gonna be. You plug that in and it looks like you get a sphere, right? Just like, just like uh, Bohr predicted you would. There's the highest probability is near the nucleus, and then it gets less and less and less as you further get out. But the shape of it is a, 
is a circle. It's a, it's a, it's a sphere. And so we call that S basically for sphere. And so the most likely place for it to be when it's in the ground state is near the nucleus. And then as you give it more energy, it gets farther away. And each one of these circles shows you it gets further and further and further and further. So at least for hydrogen, the wave way of looking at it and the particle way of looking at it give you the same answer. But later on, it gets a little freaky. So here's the second place that um, hydrogen uh, electron can be. And so since it's one more away from the nucleus, we call that two. So that would be 2s. And you can see it's a little further away. And when we look at, you know, plug in all the, all the numbers into the equation and we say, where's the most likely place for the next electron? When it gets, when it um, gets energy and moves away, where's it going to be? And it says it's going to be 250 picometers away. Okay. And what about the next place it's going to be? That would be 3s. So one is the closest, two is the next, three is the next, all the same shape, all the same spherical shape. And one more away, 680 picometers. So it keeps moving further and further and further. And again, the distances match precisely what Bohr said they were going to. So that's what basically told um, Schrodinger he was on the right track. That, you know, if his theory didn't agree with what already worked, then it's probably not great. You know, so Bohr's theory worked for hydrogen and nothing else. So it would be weird if Schrodinger came up with an idea and it worked for everything but hydrogen. So there'd have to be some way to, you know, get these two things to work together. Is there a question? So far, so good for everybody? Basically, we're dealing with just really simple circular um, shells. So we call these shells, circular shells that the electrons go in. So, so far, Bohr and Schrodinger are saying the exact same thing, using different equations to get there. Then we start getting different uh, shapes of places where, where um, electrons can be. And so we can determine the, we can determine the location of any electron in any atom with four numbers. Okay, four numbers. Oops. So the first one, oh, let me get you something that works a little better than that. four, and we call these quantum numbers. The first one basically says, well, how far away from the nucleus is it? One, two, three, four, five, six. The next one tells us where in that um, uh, orbital, in, the, in that shell. So you have shell one, shell two, shell three, they keep moving further away. So the first one tells us basically which first one, what shell is it in? Second one tells us what shape of orbital, and the orbital is inside the shell. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, what orbital is it in? The third one tells us where in that orbital is it, and the fourth one tells us whether it's spinning down or spinning up, and I'll explain that um, uh, in a minute as well. So basically four numbers. So we'll, we'll go over this again, obviously. Now, exclusion, Pauli came along with a, with a principle that says no two electrons in the atom could have those same numbers. So basically, it's like a zip code. Every electron has a different set of four. And so, and any orbital holds a maximum of two. That's going to be super, super important. Only two electrons can go into any orbital. And if there are two electrons in an orbital, one must be spinning up 
and the other must be spinning down. So we're going to go over um, what each of these numbers are and how they were derived, okay? So, as I mentioned, the first one, this basically says how far away from the nucleus is it? So we have shells basically tell us how far away it is. And these are, so this first number is pretty easy to remember. It's either one, two, three, four, five, or six. That's it. And it's just how far away is it? And so it tells us um, how far away it is and how big it is. Because basically these shells get bigger and bigger and bigger and hold more electrons as we get further and, and further away. So shell one, which is the closest to the nucleus, just has S in it. And it can hold two electrons. Because remember, every shell can only hold two electrons. So for instance, helium has two electrons. So the first one would be in 1s spinning up, and the other would be in 1s spinning down. That's it. And we basically, we, we have defined all the electrons in helium. And then we start adding more and more after that. So the first one, we, the first one is called n. The very first number is called n, and we call that the principal quantum number. What shell is it in? How far away from the nucleus is it? So that's our first one, principal. Second one, we call it angular. Now that tells us what subshell, oops, writing with white. What subshell inside that shell is it? And you'll see every time we add another shell. So at one, if our principal quantum number is one, it has one subshell in it, S, that's it. When we move to two, surprisingly, it's gonna have two subshells in it. Three is gonna have three subshells. Four is gonna have four subshells. And there's only four subshells, so you only need to know four. That's it. So the first, the first big shell, principal number, that's gonna have one subshell in it, S. Two, we move further away, it's gonna have S and another one called P. Three is gonna have S and P and another one called D. And finally, when we get out to four, five, six, anywhere above, has S and P and D and F. And I'll describe each one of those uh, in detail. So the second number, the angular number, tells us which subshell it's in. Is it in S? Is it in P? Is it in D? Or is it in F? And so the second number just says it's either going to be S is zero, P is one, uh, D is two, and F is three. So our first number is one, two, three, four, five. Our second number is zero, one, two, three. So far, so far, so good, right? The third one is called the magnetic uh, number. And it's called that because it's involved, strangely enough, in magnetism. And I'll explain why that is. It describes where in that orbital. So you remember this, or subshell, it's the same, same thing. So we have the shell, which is how far away it is. And we have the subshell inside that, that, that are different shapes. I'll go over the different shapes. And then there's orbitals within that subshell. And we'll, and we'll talk about how those things are organized. So it tells us, the magnetic one tells us where inside the subshell is it. There's different places it can be. And then finally, is it spinning up or is it spinning down? And so the last one is plus one half if it's spinning up or minus one half if it's spinning down. Okay, and it's actually the spin and where it is in the subshell that determines magnetism. We'll, we'll go over that a little bit later. So each shell 
holds at the most two. Two times what shell number it is squared. So at, it, so at energy level one, we have two times one squared equals two. So the very first shell, we can only put two electrons. That's it. But what about the second one? Two times level two squared equals two times four. Oh, that's eight. So in the second shell, we can hold eight electrons. So that's now basically everything up to neon uh, at 10. So all everything up, up to neon just has those two energy shells. Then when we start adding more electrons, the shells get even bigger. And so for three, it would be three or sorry, two times three squared. So three squared is nine times two, that's 18. So the third shell, we can put 18 electrons. And then finally the fourth one and beyond is 32. So you can see, we can stick a lot more electrons as the shells get bigger. And we'll talk about now what shapes these are. So each shell has the principal quantum number n, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. And it contains exactly n number of subshells up to four. We don't get any more than, than four. And so we call these, as I mentioned before, these are the four you need to remember. We call them S, P, P, e, and F. And there's reasons why, why, why they were called that. I'll sort of, you know, go into it, but um, it, involves, it involves the um, specter of the energies that, that, that are released when the electrons move around in them. But yeah, I don't know if it makes much, much more sense. I just try, try and figure out whatever, if you can come up with a way of, of remembering S, P, D, and F, just use it. Um, I haven't come up with a good way to, to memorize SPD. It's something, something that makes it stick in your head. I'll have to do that. It's probably a good thing to do. So the order of energies are S is the lowest, P is next, D is after that, and then F is the highest. So F is the highest level, then D, then P, then S. So each of these subshells has places for electrons, and we call those orbitals. S has one place for electrons to be. P has three places for electrons to be. D has five, and F has seven. Now I'll, ex I'll explain why that is. It'll help you um, remember it. Okay, so and you remember each orbital has has space for two electrons. So S can hold how many electrons? Two. Two, exactly. So S can have two. How many can P have? Eight. No. Nope. No. Nope. Um, six. S S plus P could have eight. That's right. But P by itself can only have six. What about D? 10. 10. Mm -hmm. And what about F? 14. 14, exactly. It's just two, two electrons in each. So, yeah, that's why the math of figuring this out isn't nearly as insane as, as, as the math of Schrodinger's equation. Um, because when you get right down to it, when you get down to the places where the electrons are, it's actually fairly straightforward. How we got there is insanely difficult. Um, <laughs> once we get past that, the way that this thing is organized actually makes some sense. And hopefully uh, by the end of this, it, it might make a little more sense to you. So, oh, damn it. Here we go. 
Yeah, so these, these are the, uh, the words that are actually where the S, P, D, and F come from. It may help you to remember them. It may not. I'm not sure. So S comes from sharp. And I think it's because as electrons move from one S level to another, um, it's very defined um, uh, waves come out that you can measure very accurately. And they're very um, bright and they're very sharp. So you can, so you can, you can see them easily. P is for principle. And so it has, as I mentioned, three orbitals inside of it for a total of six electrons. D is for diffuse. Oh, you could ask me all day where diffuse comes from. I really don't know. I can't remember where diffuse comes from, but D is for diffuse. Probably because um, electrons moving around in, in D subshells, it's kind of hard to detect those um, waves. And I think, I think they're, they're rather diffuse. And then F stands for fun and mental, fundamental. And again, seven um, orbitals in F for a total of 14. So one way, and we'll get to this in a sec, but one way to remember this is that every time we add a new orbital, and this is where looking at some of the sort of simple math kind of helps us. So S, there's one place for the orbital to be. There's just one, right? And so the number, we call that zero. So it's um, the second quantum number is zero, okay? P, so it has zero, but we add two more places and we call them plus one and minus one. And in fact, these are the magnetic quantum numbers. That is the only place electrons can go in S is zero. With P, it can go here, or here, or here, or three different places. And the, three diff the address of those three places are minus one, zero, and plus one. Now we add another level of complexity with D. We add another two places. What do we add? Minus two and minus one and zero and plus one and plus two. We add two more places, one to, the, to each side, one to the minus side, one to the plus side. So now we have one, two, three, four, five places the electron can be. And since each one holds two, 10 electrons total. And so you could probably guess what happens with F, right? What happens with F? We're gonna add two more uh, places for electrons to be. What are we going to call them? Where are the two new places that F electrons can go? Negative three and plus three. Exactly. So now we've got minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, and plus three for a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, all right, seven places. And since each place holds two, that's 14. So this is the way to remember. Before someone, before I realized this, I had a lot of trouble. Because um, I was basically trying to memorize all these numbers, and it's impossible. I, well, I can't. I have a really hard time memorizing things. But if I remember something um, that sort of sticks in my head, then I can always derive it. So that's how I do it. So if S is zero, I just keep adding two more places each time. One in the negative side, one in the plus side. And it turns out that these are the actual magnetic quantum numbers. So I don't have to memorize them. I can derive them from scratch. Because zero, I can remember that. One less and one more, I can remember that. And then another one, and another one, and another one, and I'm done. So basically, these are all the magnetic uh, quantum numbers, and so not that not that difficult to to remember. Okay, 
So, Professor, uh, for yep. S, that means it has zero energy? No, that's just an address. Okay. It's just an address. That's all it is. So, um, it basically just, it just tells us where it is. That's, that's all. Okay. It just means there's one subshell in it. And this is the name. Basically, these are names. These don't have any other, other um, meaning except they're just names. They're like a zip code. So this is just a name. Oops, let me go back. That is just the name of a place where electrons can go. That's it. So let's, look, for instance, if we looked at the, um, at the only electron for hydrogen, if we gave it the address, it would be one since it's in, since it's in the first level. Second one would be zero since it's in the S. Third one would be zero again, because there's only one place it can be. And the fourth number would be plus one half. Because we say the first electron into the house gets to be plus, and the second one into the house gets to be minus. So that is basically the address for hydrogen's electron. Then you're done. One, zero, zero, plus one half. That's it. Okay? And obviously we're gonna, we're gonna do a little a few few more of these to show you how it works. So S, it's the only one S um, orbital in it. P sublevel has three, as we've mentioned before. D has five, and F has seven. They also give you some more information. They all have different shapes. So S, the only one we know of so far. Uh, the only shape we've looked at so far is S. So what, what shape was that? Do you remember what shape it was? Even starts with S. Circular? Sphere? A sphere. Yeah, circular or spherical. Yeah, either, either way. It's a, it's, a, it's a sphere. You're going to find out the shapes for the other ones are a little, a little weirder. Um, so S is a spherical shape. Back. Having a hard time with my drawing tonight. Oh, where are we? Yes, here we go. Man, I keep moving around on me. Yes, yeah, so, so we're looking at the shape. So we already know that S is spherical. What we're going to see is that the other, as we get more and more complex and putting more and more electrons in, they have to have more and more weird shapes in order to um, keep these uh, electrons organized. So P actually has what we call a two-lobed orbital that kind of looks, we'll see that it kind of looks like this. It looks like a barbell. And so subscripts may be used to indicate the orientation. Uh, we won't go too much into that, but uh, when we look at uh, the p orbital, we'll see that it um, has this particular dumbbell shape, but in three dimensions. So it runs along the, this, we sort of get a dumbbell shape in the x dimension. We get one coming in and coming out in the y, and we have another one going up and going down in the Z orientation. And I'll show you a, little, a lot better picture than what I've got here. So an orbital can be empty, it can have no electrons in it, it can have one electron in it, or it can have two, but that's it. There's no room for any more. So there's one, zero, one, or two, no more than that. And as I mentioned, if, there, if you have two living in the same orbital, one spins up and the other spins down, okay? Let's have a look at some of these. So we're gonna look at some of these shapes. So the first letter is N for the, for the principal quantum number. The second one is called L. Oops, the second one is called L. And what that tells you is what shape it has. It tells you whether it's S, or P, or B, or F, and then each one of those has a different shape, okay? So if N 
is one, two, three, four, etc. L is zero, one, two, or three. Zero for S, one for P, two for D, three for F. And these are sort of, I love the description of the shapes. So S's are spherical. P looks like two balloons tied at the knots. Yeah, it kind of does. D orbitals look like four balloons tied at the knots. So, okay, kind of imagine what that looks like. And F orbitals look like eight balloons tied at the, yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine what eight balloons all tied at the knots would look like. But I'll, I'll show you what they look like. Um, yeah, the shapes get kind of weird um, as, as we put more and more electrons in them. So, so this is the second quantum number. First one is where is the electron, how far away from the nucleus. Second one is what shape, what shape um, uh, subshell is it in? These are the four different shapes. So here's the simplest one for us because we've looked at it already. Uh, it's the lowest energy orbital. So someone was asking earlier about uh, energies. This one is the lowest energy, is, is S. So at one, at principle quantum number one, which is the closest to the nucleus, S is the only orbital, so it's the lowest. When we move up one, we go to two, and there's S. And then there's also two P, because remember, each time we add a shell, we add another subshell. This is the second subshell we're adding. So the S would be the lower energy of electrons moving into the second shell. So one S would be the lowest, two S would come next, and then two P on top of that. And so we would fill this one first, this one second, and this one third, okay? So it's spherical, and it doesn't have any nodes in it. And a node is just basically a place where, the, uh, where we see no uh, electron density, where we don't see anything. And you can see, since it's a sphere, it's even all the way through. There nodes. There's no place in here where the electron doesn't appear to be. I'm not going to talk too much about nodes. It's a little advanced. So the second one, L equals, so that's L equals zero. So this is our second quantum number, the magnetic quantum number, uh, the zero. No, sorry, principal. So second one, L equals zero. That's P, that's S. Now I'm confusing myself. That's S. Next one, L equals one, that's P, okay? And so there's three places in a p orbital for electrons to be. We sort of mentioned that before. And we just called them minus one, zero, and plus one. So if s is zero, p, remember we just add to take away one and add one. So it has three places to be. And, and these are the names of the three places they can be. It's the second lowest energy. If s is the lowest energy, p is the next lowest. And it has two lobes. I'll show, I'll show you what that looks like. So this is what they look like. Okay, so it seems like we have, it kind of looks like a balloon, sort of knotted together, um, tied together at the middle. And so you can see it's along the three different axes. So here we've got X going in this direction. And then we have Y going in this direction, and then Z going up and down. And so in each one, we can put a pair of electrons. So we have two electrons here, two electrons here, and two electrons here for a total of six. Okay, so, so this kind of makes sense to me anyway. It's like, oh, okay, two in each direction. All right. Well, you know, I'll buy that. And so we just call them PX, PY, and PZ, or minus one, zero, and plus one. We're just going to call them minus one, zero, and, 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 and plus one. So six, places for six 
uh, electrons to be. And the shape is not that outrageous. I could actually put, you know, kind of wrap my head around that. It's when we start getting into these more advanced orbitals that they start getting weird. So now we're at L equals two. So remember, it's the second quantum number. And basically the second one tells you what shape uh, the orbital is. So if S was, S was zero and P was one, now D is equal to two. So now L is equal to two. So now we have a new shape. And it has, as we mentioned before, five places to put electrons. Minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two, just like we mentioned before. We keep adding one at the end and one at the beginning. We add another negative one and another positive one every time we increase. And so, and, and each one of those places has room for two electrons for a total of 10. So we can fit 10 electrons in a D orbital. And it is the next one up in energy. So we get to level three, the lowest le energy level would be S, and the next would be P, and next would be D. So D is higher than, than P. So we would fill S first, then we would fill P, then we would fill D, okay? Any questions so far? I realize this is like, this is kind of heavy stuff. Um, are, are you people digging it or is it a little, a little bit too much? I'm going slow and we're gonna, we, and we'll go over it many times. This is just sort of the introduction is always a bit much. Is it too much at this stage? Brain hurts a little. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. The first, the first time you're introduced to this stuff, it doesn't make any sense. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Hopefully, on the, you know, maybe by about the 15th or 16th time you've looked at it, like, even, even if you understand it a little bit, okay. Because remember what I pointed out last night, nobody understands this. Physicists don't understand it. I mean, the, the reason why we keep teaching it is because it explains the periodic table perfectly. And I'll, I'll show you like how it fits. It fits perfectly the, the periodic table. It explains how electrons move from one um, um, atom to another. It explains exactly uh, how bonds are formed. It, it, it explains all of it. It explains why some um, metals lose one electron and some lose two and others uh, can lose a varying uh, number. It explains all of that perfectly. So if it didn't, I mean, we wouldn't bother teaching it, but it explains it all perfectly. So if we can understand this, even just a little bit, um, it makes our understanding of the periodic table so much, it makes it, everything will sort of fall into place. So even if we get like maybe a quarter of this or, or, or a half of this, it makes the understanding of everything else much easier to, to think about because then there's less memorization and more understanding. And that's really what I want you guys to get. I hate memorization. I'm old and stupid. My brain is full of prions. So I need to be able to link one thing to another thing or else I'll forget both of them. So this allows us to link all of this, like these weird you know, numbers and shells and everything else, but it links it so beautifully to um, chemistry and, and how these things actually work that you know, it's definitely worth knowing. So I'll, I'll leave it that way. But don't worry, we're, this is not the last time we're gonna talk about this and then I'm gonna, you know, it's gonna be a test tomorrow. No, we're gonna talk about it a lot and go over it many times because I think it's, it's worth the effort, it really is. So prepare your, pre prepare your brains because now we're gonna see what the hell it looks like. So this one isn't even that weird. D isn't that weird. It's sort of like the, um, the previous description was, okay, I take four balloons and I tie them together. Eh, okay. Yeah, so that, that kind of makes sense. Um, so here's our first one. Here's our 
So there's four sort of balloons tied together, and then the second one, and then the third one, and the fourth one. Then when you get to the fifth one, notice it doesn't look anything like the others. That's where Schrodinger's equation makes these bizarre shapes that only make sense if you're you know, a physicist or something. Like, tell me why this is related to that. Because personally, I don't get it. But that's why we're not going to have um, tests to like, you know, draw each of these. <laughs> because I certainly can't draw. I can't draw a stick figure, let alone something like this. But these are the shapes that um, Schrodinger's equation predicts that they're going to be. So we have place for one, two, three, four, five places to put electrons. Each place can hold two for a total of 10. Now, another thing to remember, um, each one of these levels is equal in energy. So S is a lower energy than P and D is a higher energy than, than uh, P, but each of these orbitals is exactly the same energy. So an electron goes in, it could basically go in any of these because they're all the same energy, okay? So basically, all we want to take away from this, okay, cool, five places to put electrons, each one is two for a total of 10. And it's a weird shape, cool. Because we haven't really got to the really weird shapes yet. Now we're going to get to the weird, the <laughs> really weird shapes. Because now we finally are at L equals three, the last shape. So S was zero, T was one, D was two, and now F, the final one, the big one, um, is L equals three. Or so our second quantum number is the shape. So now we're at the last one. So every principal shell. Principal energy state just means the shell, how far away from the nucleus it is. So all the ones above three have d orbitals in them. So one has s, two has s and p, three has s, p, and d, and then anything above three has all four of them, has s, p, d, and f, okay? And remember, now that we've, we've gone one up, in energy, and we've increased the number of, of electrons we can add. We always add two new houses, one at the end, one at the beginning. So now we have minus three and plus three for a total of seven places to put electrons. Each one can hold two for a total of 14. So this thing can hold 14 electrons, and it's the highest um, energy state in any level. So in Level one, there's only one uh, uh, subshell, that's S, so it's the highest. Level two, P is the highest. Level three, D is the highest. And then once we get up to four, five, and six, F is the highest. So it's the highest energy. It gets filled last. After S, P, and D all are filled with electrons, then we start adding them to F, okay? And... Here's the shape of F. <laughs> so you see now the first couple kind of do look like um, eight balloons all sort of, you know, tied together. But then it gets, I don't know, then you get these sort of weird top hat looking, looking shapes. I don't know what the hell to make of this. And then, so there's like basically three different shapes going on here. There's this one, which is similar to all, they all look kind of similar. But then, this one's different. This one looks like that one, and I don't know what the hell. Well, I guess that one's the same, but in a different direction. Okay, so you get basically two different shapes. You get the eight, you get the balloons, eight balloons, and then you get the top hats. Take home message, they're all equal energy to each other. There's seven places to put electrons, and each one can hold two for a total of 14. And it gets filled last. So. Great. We have all, yeah, you've told us all this useless information. What does it have to do with anything, right? We should probably have this to do with something. I agree.
the little, little close up of what, what it looks. I just love the look of it. So what does it mean? So these are the different subshells. Uh, first is the is the main shell, and as I mentioned before, it's one. It's closest to the nucleus, and it can hold two. And there's our two S. So one S, and there they are. Move one away, and we add P. So there's P has now been added, and so there's room for eight. Two here and six there. Okay. Then we move one further away. So we start with S again. We always start with S. Second one's P, that's room for six. And then we have room for 10 more in D. So the third one, third level further away, is 18 electrons in it. Move one further away. We finally introduce F. But again, always start with S, second one, six go in P, as it always does, 10 go in D, and then finally 14 go in F for a total of 32. So the, we should be able to figure out fairly quickly how many electrons can go in each shell. So right now, it's just the confusing thing for me when I'm trying to remember this, is what the hell is a shell versus a subshell versus an orbital? And sort of the way to think about it is that the shell is how far away it is from the nucleus. So one, it's basically the, that's the, the, the easiest thing to think about. It's like, it's, where is it far from, if it's close to the nucleus, it's, it's the first shell, you move further away, the second shell. So the shell basically has all the electrons in it. The subshell is this one. What shape? S is a subshell. P is a subshell, D and F. You got four different flavors of subshells. And then finally, orbitals just tell you how many different places inside this subshell are there for electrons. S has just one place for it to be. P has three. And remember, we keep adding one, one more on each side. So three, and then five, and then seven. Okay? And then each one has room for two. So, I swear this has something to do with something. So these are our take home, just those four numbers. Okay, so we've, we don't remember anything else from, from today. Just remember there's four numbers that define where each electron is. So burn this into your brain, if, if, if at all possible. So, oops, let me go back. So first place, what shell? How far away is it? What's the one, two, three, or four? Second one, what shape of the, of the, and that shouldn't be orbital, I should say subshell. But yes, Jacina. Uh, we did have a question in the chat asking when our first exam would be. Oh, um, probably week after next, I would think, or maybe even the end of next week. That I, now that I think about it. Let me talk with Dr. Gagreb. We'll, we'll, we'll come to a, because we probably should have one soon. I keep, I keep forgetting how short the, the summers are. We only have eight weeks, so we should probably have one next week. Probably, um, the lab. probably give it to you on Thursday, and then you can give it back to me on Friday. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. So yeah, I need to change. Also, the, oh, yeah, go ahead. But we also have a lab exam next week on, is it Thursday or Friday? I think Thursday. Oh, has it already been? Oh, that's right. It's already there. Um, all right. So probably Monday then, I guess, probably. Um, yeah, again, let me think about it. Let me, let me, uh, I need to talk with, uh, with uh, Michael about it. And we'll, we'll, so we'll be able, we'll be able to tell you before Monday. Okay. Okay. But remember, you get to take it home, so, because you're at home. Uh, uh, can we just, we have the lab in week and the lecture exam in the other week, not all together? Yeah, no, no, yeah, I won't put them at the, the same, yeah. No, no I'd move them apart, definitely. And then they also asked if we need to know labs one through three for the lab exam. Yep. That's, the, that's kind of the point, yes. 
and possibly four as well, because we're going to be doing number four on Monday. Yep, so be the first four. Yeah, uh, is that Erica? Erica, yes. Yeah, um, so since we're discussing orbitals, mm -hmm. or I don't know if we touched based on this today, if it went by, but um, if we're gonna be like looking at hybrid, oh, hybridization. Um, maybe slightly, yeah. Yeah, maybe a little, but I mean, yeah, it's it. We're not really going to have time to get into it in a in a, in a big way, because um, yeah, because the take home lesson here is these are the orbitals um, of a particular atom, and then we find out later on that when two atoms come a walking and they start sharing electrons, they take they have different orbitals that have that have di different shapes, but I think we're mostly going to focus on on this for right now and I'll have to see how much time we have. Got it, thanks. But yeah, if we have time, maybe, but yeah, I I I, I don't know if we're gonna have time. Because we're sort of stuck. If we were in the regular class, definitely we would. Okay. All right. So first principle, these are the four numbers. N M M N L M L for magnetic L, and then MS for spin. So the first one is, is this the shell? Which one? One, two, three, four, five. Second one, shape of the subshell. So that would be our S, P, D, and F. And I need to change that from orbital, naughty. Um, third one, where in the subshell is it? And so that would be our minus one, zero, plus one minus two, minus one, basically where is it? What's its orientation in space? Because each one of those weird shapes I was showing, each one of those weird shapes is either minus one or zero or plus one. That's, that's what those represent. And then finally, if you're the first one in, you get the spin up, but if you're the second one in, you get the spin down. And that's basically it for the, those are the four, those four numbers will describe the location of any, electron and according remember according to, to Pauli um hey Pauli they got to be different every electron has to have a different um address and even if they're in the exact same place they have to have opposite spins so they can't be the same see this is just the uh, review again um so these are the different so n again tells you where how far away L tells you which subshell, what kind, what kind of weird uh, shape it is. Third one tells you where in the subshell it is. It tells you the exact orbital. So first is shell, subshell, orbital, spin. Those are the four, those are the four numbers, okay? And so let's get, these are the order for filling them up. You will not have to memorize this. I have a, a cool way of, of showing you how this works. So what it shows you is that as you go up, eat additional energy. So as the lowest energy electron is in 1s, right down here. Then when I added, so when I fill this one, the first two go in here, first one, hydrogen, two, helium, and the next one, next two go here, one, two, and then the next six, Go here, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then S and then so on and so on and so on. And you can see once we start getting way up here, the energies between the different um, uh, sublevels get really small. And that actually explains um, transition metals because the difference in energy between F and D, once you get into these transition metals, is so small that electrons easily move back and forth between them. And that is why some um, metals can have a charge of plus two. And then, oh God. And others can have a charge of plus three. If it looks stupid, I need to, okay, just hang on for a sec.
All right, should have done that before we, before we began, sorry. Someone likes to drive their motorcycle around at this time of night. Like, so that's the order they go in and I'll show you an easy way. You don't have to memorize this because basically I don't want you to memorize anything. I want you to understand this stuff. So this is the way you can, you can uh, figure it out. It's the way I do it. Um, basically draw yourself a little um, uh, grid and just put S, P, D, and F on the top, and then just put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on the side, okay? And then we just go diagonal lines, starting one S, okay? And then we come back, start the next one, two S, come back, start the next one, two P, three S, and then come back, and then three P, and then four S, and then 3D. Notice that we filled 4S before we filled 3D. Because, like as I mentioned, as we get higher and higher and higher in energy, the differences between these start to get really, really close. And D is actually a higher energy level than S. So we actually fill level four before we go back down and finish filling level three. And so you'd never be able to remember that, but if you make this little uh, chart, you'll be able to remember. So, but of course, you won't even have to, you'll just have this for your test, you won't have to worry about it. But that's just, uh, but if you didn't have, a, have this, on a, uh, if you were taking a test, this would be the way to, to remember the order that they're filled in, okay? So, now we're going to look at how how we uh, these electron configurations work. Electron configuration basically tells you where all the electrons in a particular atom. So all we need to do this is the atomic number and our little chart, right? So here's our little chart. Here's our atomic number. So phosphorus has 15 electrons. So this is what the electron configuration looks like. We just say it's filled up the 1s with 2. It's filled up the 2s with 2. Then it fills up 2p. So here's my 2p. That's 6. And then 2s has 2. So I've got a total of how many electrons so far? Twelve. Yeah, I got 12. 2 plus 2 plus 6 plus 2 is 12. So what number goes here? Three. 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 Yeah. So that would just be 3P3. And so when we're counting, we're trying to figure out how many valence electrons uh, an element has. Valence electrons are the number of electrons it has in its outermost shell. And it's the number of valence electrons that, that an element has that determines its chemical characteristics. So how many valence electrons does phosphorus have? Three? Nope. Five. And it's, and it's five, yes, in its outermost shell, not the subshell outermost shell. It has five. Two plus three. Does anyone remember what charge phosphorus takes on when it's an ion? When it's a phosphide ion. Do you remember what the charge is? Is it plus three? It's three, but you're wrong with the plus. Negative. Negative three. That's right. It's a non-metal, remember. And so non-metals like to be negative. And so hopefully, I'm going to show you something that might make some sense. So if I was to draw the little house, the little 3P house where the electrons go, remember, here's my... Actually, why don't I just, now I'll just leave it there. So 
I'm going to draw my little 3p house here. So here's minus 1, here's 0, and here's plus 1. So how many electrons do I have in uh, 3p for phosphorus? Three. Three. So when I put them in, how do I put them in like this? I put one here, another one here, and another one here. You fill them, you put them in one at a time. Because basically electrons are negatively charged. They don't like to be in the same place at the same time. So they like to be spread out as much as they as they possibly can. So, we do not multiply three by three. I'm sorry? You do not multiply three times three? No, this is just an address. Oh, okay. Three P is an address. Oh, okay. And so three P has three electrons in it. And so here is what that would look like. So, and you're gonna be drawing these as well. So this is an electron configuration. And then you're actually gonna be drawing the diagrams of where the electrons are. But I sort of wanted to show you this to get you ready for it. So here's my 3p um, electron configuration for phosphorus, okay? So it's, this is what phosphorus looks like and where its electrons are. Now, how, many, how much room for more electrons does it have? Three. Three, right? And we would put them Here, one, two, three. And when I add three more electrons, notice that my house now is completely filled. So now it becomes 3P6 when it's phosphide. And notice that now every orbital, every subshell is filled. They're all filled to capacity. And that is the stablest um, confirmation for an element to be is to have everything filled because as we as we look as we go through the periodic table we will find that the thing that all the noble gases have in common every single orbital is filled and so they don't have any space for any more like they don't want to give any electrons away because then it wouldn't be filled anymore. And they don't want to take any more electrons either because there's no place to put them. So that's why phosphorus takes three electrons. So it can put them there, there, and there. Oxygen has room um, for, well, not oxygen. What's the next element? Phosphorus, what's 16? 16 sulfur, right? 16 yeah. is sulfur. So six, so let me go back. So six sulfur would have 16 electrons. So it would have this one and this one already there. It would only have room for two electrons. And guess where they go? That one and that one. And that's why sulfur is a charge of minus two because sulfur adds two more electrons and now its subshells are completely filled and it's achieved chemical nirvana. Basically, every element wants to achieve chemical nirvana by filling all their subshells completely. And then they're completely, then, then they're much more stable than they are without it, okay? So I think that's probably a good place to wrap up and ask for questions for today. It's a lot to take in today, I realize. But hopefully, I just sort of wanted to show you this because you can see that it really explains um, chemical characteristics of, of these elements, it's, it, you know, in a very elegant way, I think. So we'll spend a lot more time on it uh, next week. So I, I realize everyone's head is probably smoking right now, but yeah, who's, who's, who's got some questions? So generally, like when we're setting up the electron configuration, mm -hmm. we would need to fill up, um, all of the, what is it called? You like what, go what ahead. you wrote out right there. So mm -hmm. instead of like having it be um, like two in uh, the negative one and then just one 
at zero, you need to have them all disperse. Uh, if I want the complete electron configuration, yeah, you basically have to say where all of them are. We're going to learn there's, um, there's a shortcut um, for doing these. The shortcut is just what's the closest um, um, noble gas and just go from there. Because when, we, when, when you're given the electron configuration of something like uranium, it'll take you forever to, I mean, it's got like 92 electrons or something. You'll be, you know, writing them out forever. So just go to who's the closest noble gas. Okay, it's xenon plus, you know, these seven more electrons. Is, was, was that your question or you wanted to know something? What, did you have to draw the, basically a box for all of the electrons? Because we will do that as well. Um, I mean, like, I was thinking more like when you set up the, the molecular orbital diagram mm -hmm. um, and when you put in the um, electrons. Okay. Because um, I know that there's also different rules that apply, but yep. I was asking, like, generally, it's that you would have to spread them out instead of um, making sure that they're together to fill. Uh, yeah, basically, I don't know if it matters. It does, it, yeah, it does matter. It matters when it comes to magnetism. Um, since electrons are negatively charged, like I said before, they generally don't want to be they, they repel each other, right? So if you have, if you have, I mean, quickly, let's clear that for a sec. So if we have, uh, where's my draw? So, okay, here, I'll make my little house. So this is the P orbital. So I've got my minus one, zero, plus one. So if I fill them up one at a time, it's actually a lower energy. So here's my first one, second one, third one. That's actually a lower energy level than if I put that one there. And then that would actually be higher energy because we've got two electrons in the same, in a relatively uh, the same area repelling each other. And so that is, that's a higher energy state and basically um, atoms will go to the lowest energy state possible. So they will give off energy to get to the lowest energy state possible. So that is this configuration with two in the same, in the same orbital and one being empty is a higher energy. And so it's generally not, um, you don't, you don't see it. And I'll get to, I'll, so a little bit later when we talk about magnetism, I'll explain why this makes more, why having them in separate shells first before we add the, the, the next one makes more sense. So yeah, so basically we fill them one at a time and then we start putting two in just because it's, it's, it's the lower energy state because of the electron repulsion. That's, that's the main reason. When you okay. fill them, all it's going to be up, up, and then when you put the second one, you will put down. Yep. Like, I yep. thought like you put one up, one down, one up, one down, then you go back and you reverse. No, they all, they're all, the first one in is always spinning up. Okay. And the second one spins down. And again, it, it comes back to magnetism. Um, so when I show, this is the spin of the electrons is what explains magnetism. Like I, you know, still magnetism is kind of a mystery to me. But when I look at the electron configuration and how the electrons are ordered, then it makes a lot more sense. It's like, oh, that's why this element is, is magnetic and this one isn't. And it's basically, it's the number, the more unpaired electrons that an element has, the more magnetic it is. And that, that's basically what it comes down to. So iron has a certain number of unpaired electrons. It's magnetic. And then you get into some of these rare earth metals like niobium and that, and they have a lot more unpaired electrons and they're really magnetic. So it's basically unpaired electrons all spinning in the same direction, which leads to magnetism. So for 3P3, would it be all up? 
And yeah, then if exactly. Yeah, just like I showed you the first time. So it would be, it would look like this. One, two, three. That would be 3P3. And that's it, right? And that's it. Yeah, you're done. Yep. So then the next one, so like I said, sulfur would go there. And then, so that has room for two electrons. And then after sulfur is 17, and that is chlorine, right? So chlorine has one there. And so that's why chlorine always has a charge of what? Negative. Negative one. Negative, Negative one. one. Because there's room for exactly one electron there. And so that's basically why um, all the elements in the seventh row, so seven being this two and that five, that's where the seven comes from, they want that last electron really bad. And when we, when we start talking about electronegativity, which is how much an element can pull electrons away from other people, they're really electronegative. So they just have one more electron to go and they really want to get there. I mean, they're almost super, super stable. They're really close. And so they have a very strong pull on that uh, one more electron to get them to nirvana. Because then chlorine is minus one, bing, and now it looks like a noble gas. That's the same electron configuration is a noble gas, and they all want that. Yeah, we'll talk more about this on Monday. But yeah, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things. It's one of my favorite chapters, because I think it explains everything so well, even if it is kind of got some trippy math in it and everything. Once we get down to, to this, then it makes a lot of sense. It just takes a while for us to get there. So any, any, anything else before we call it, a, call it an evening? Will you be showing us in the future, like a, the, it's not really a trick, but it's like looking at the periodic table and like um, reading like across the. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, you can actually, that's why I say the periodic table, if you have a periodic table, you don't really need anything else. The periodic table tells you exactly how many electrons are in S, how many electrons are in P, how many electrons are in D, and how many electrons are in F. The periodic table tells you. So, and you can just go across the periodic table and you can actually do the electron configuration yourself just by looking at the periodic table. That's why it's, I think it's just so beautiful because it, it explains everything so nice. It, it all fits together. And so um, if you can see that, if you can like see how it fits together, it makes, it makes the rest of the chemistry actually like fairly straightforward. Then you can just worry about math because no, you know, everyone has trouble doing math. But this is beauty, right? <laughs> okay, so call that a night. And um, yeah, these, so these, these have been posted. Hopefully you've seen on um, Canvas that the, the slides have been posted. Um, I will let you know when the lab uh, kits come in. They may get in next week. More than likely, will be in next week. So I'll, I'll let you know when you can come pick them up. But we're planning on Monday being another virtual lab, and possibly Wednesday. I don't know. It, it depends whether the kits get here or not. Should okay. Start oh, ordering go ahead. Kits. Excuse me. We start ordering the lab the lab kits. They've been ordered for you. Wait, so we don't have to pay for it like through the bookstore? It's a it's a buck. I think it's I think it's a dollar. Yeah. I think you put in a certain deposit um, at the beginning and then you get your deposit back when you return it at the end. It's like thirty five bucks or something like that. So it's like thirty six dollars or something, and then at the end of the term when you when you re, when you return it, they give you thirty five dollars back. So it winds up being like a buck. It's just so so you can so you'll bring it back, <laughs> basically. So we don't have to order them every time. A professor for the lab report. Mm -hmm. 
because there are some question if i'm not sure about my answer i will get like minus because i do not get the right answer uh, not if you, not if you explain yourself well okay. yeah i mean if you don't answer anything then yeah you'll lose points for that but if you you know if you stand up for yourself and make, make a good argument oh, i'm willing to listen okay and for recitation mm -hmm. are you going to post the k answer or no yes um like the first two probably before the exam but i can't i can't give all of them because some people are still working on them yeah yeah but probably the first two yeah okay yeah i'll i'll, I'll, I'll talk with dr Gagreb and, and yeah we'll come up with a yeah, I forgot about the lab exam on Thursday. So, yeah, probably Monday. Yeah, probably Monday, I guess, would probably be a good day for it. Okay, Professor, I have just a quick question regarding recitation number two. Mm -hmm. Because today I have to submit. There is a question, uh, what's the name of the species? SO3 and the charge negative two. Mm -hmm. What is that? I don't know. Oh, it's a polyatomic ion. Basically, what is it? So it's 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 this. It's SO three. Yeah. Two. What's the name yeah, of that? I yeah, I don't know what's the name. You could look it up. So I just look it up. <laughs> you know, or like. Yeah, you just look it up. You got Google. Uh, I mean, it is it is it is in the it it is in the slides. That that one is is in the slides. Basically, remember the most number of uh, oxygens. S is just I want to understand. S is sulfur and O mm -hmm. is oxide. Oxygen, how right? Is, how would change it to be sulfide? I know the answer. Sulfide. So the, right. So the most the most number of of oxygens that um, sulfur can have is four. So SO four minus two is sulf eight. So we remove one oxygen, remember, and we changed eight to ite. Okay. That's why it's sulfite. That's where that comes from. Okay, got you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and later on when we start drawing um, uh, uh, bonding for these, you'll see how you could have the same number of oxygens that, or different number of oxygens and still have the same charge. That, that part's kind of fun too. When you, we draw lots of diagrams, Lewis diagrams. Do you remember the Lewis dot diagrams when you were in high school? Yep. Those, are, those are fun to do. Anyway, yeah, I gotta go. So, um, yeah, any questions, uh, e e email me. I'm gonna be checking my email tomorrow and over through the weekend. Uh, if your brain hurts with this, don't worry. Everyone's brain does it first. Um, it'll eventually come back to room temperature and you'll be fine. Okay, I will see all of you on Monday.